you know, we're doing it for money's sake or to have more cloud or to have more success or to have more zeros or be able to have more expensive things that we can show off to the rest of the world. And it's not about wellness. It's not about, oh, I need a healthy body, mind, spirit, and family. And those are the things that are important and how much money then is required in my life to that really support to underwrite the cost of living a life that's well, W-E-L-L. And our, our society is um, always more is better. And whether that's more zeros, more money in the bank, and then we get pretty stingy when it comes to our body's own health. We kind of treat ourselves like a slave. I don't know if, you, if you've seen that in entrepreneurs, but a lot of them push them themselves to just until they literally collapse and then they finally do something about their health. And I don't know about you, but the bigger my business gets, the bigger the challenges, the, the more expensive the problems, the more complaining and the more HR, and, you know, it doesn't get easier with bigger. So we want to find that number that's our number, that's, that's about our meaningful life and our meaningful business is connected to our meaningful life and integrate these together. Welcome, everybody, to Unreasonable Health Podcast. This is your host today, Cade Archibald, and I am uh, really, really honored to be here with you all. We're going to be diving into a really unique uh, interview and, and podcast today. Before we dive in there, I want to kind of, uh, first of all, go over our uh, Health Accelerator Challenge uh, that we talked about last night. Um, if you're not a part of the Health Accelerator community and those challenges, go to accueastwest.com forward slash hack. Uh, check those out. This is where uh, you get live uh, access to Reagan and I uh, real time. You can ask questions. We go through different challenges. It's a, a fun process. Uh, and so we got we covered some really cool stuff on peptide bioregulators uh, last night. As, uh, and that is the big challenge is either get your carotid artery scan or get the, uh, try out some peptide bioregulators if you haven't tried those out before. And so you can reach out to East West to get those or, or there, um, there's other resources as well. Um, so on today's show, uh, we're going to dive in. We have a, a guest appearance. She is an awesome, uh, just a, a very cool, unique uh, individual. And we're really excited to be able to introduce this interview uh, that Reagan does uh, with Christina Wise. Uh, who is Christina Wise? She's a real estate mogul, millionaire coach, creator of several multi million dollar businesses, including Good Life, Luxury a paperless agent, most recently, wealthy, wealthy. Uh, she is also an international speaker, award-winning author of the Amazon best-selling Falling for Money, uh, a romance novel for your bank account, uh, named one of the 100 most influential real estate leaders in the country. She's been featured in USA Today, as well as by Apple, uh, contractually and Evernote for her creative leadership with emerging technologies. So uh, you guys enjoy this interview with Christina Wise and Reagan Archibald. Okay, well, it's so good to be here, everybody, on Unreasonable Health. And I've, I've brought in my friend Christina Wise with Wealthy, Wealthy Wise. And um, Christina, welcome to the show. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Have fun. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Me too. Now, um, Christina and I hosted a retreat together in February of 23, and it was such a great experience. And, and I, I mentioned this to you, Christina, but one of the things you'll find in this conversation is that Christina is somebody who has uh, a, an enormous amount of intention and power behind what she says. And when I got to know more about your story, because I we'd known each other just working on your health issues, but... And, and I, I'd known what you did for a profession, but when I really learned your story and learned who you were as a person, I just had a whole nother uh, level of respect and admiration. And so 
Um, I'm hoping maybe you could share with, with my audience a little bit about you and what you've been through uh, in order to decide that, that, you know, health and wealth are need to be focused on, you know, together and combined. Yeah, just I, I yeah, I'll share a little story and work to keep it as concise as possible. But before that, what's interesting is when I really started in the journey that I'm on now, which is wealth and wealth, W-E-L-L-T-H, it's that when I really started diving into this, I started looking at the etymology of the word wealth, W-E-A-L-T-H, and even looking at the etymology of wellness, of, of health, of H-E-A-L-T-H. And they both, come, the etymology goes up to the same words, which is wheel, W-E-I-L, which means wealth. And it first started with health wealth, and that turned into money wealth. So even when you really look at the just the language, wealth and health are the same word. Like they started, they just kind of bifurcated and, mm -hmm. and you know took on a little bit of different meaning. But the more I really studied this and just thought my own life and others' lives, it's realizing like, no, these really are like this two sides of the same coin. And when we can understand our wealth, our money wealth, and our health, and if they are two sides of the same coin, I think we can approach these two subjects differently by looking at them the same thing, but looking at them differently or at different times, depending on, you know, is it heads or tails at any given moment? But uh, so... <laughs> Simple story. My 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 kind of money story, if you will, is today I'm a I'd say a money coach, a money consultant, a money mentor, and I really teach wealth, meaning how much money is enough to live a good life, is mm -hmm. really what I teach, and I teach that philosophically, in the sense of what is a good life, and practically how much does it cost to live it, and then very programmatically and systematically, especially to entrepreneurs, so so that we know our numbers, so we know what we're doing this for to help us keep on track that that's what I do now as opposed to my journey. So it's, it's doesn't escape me that I find it funny in a way, not maybe funny, haha, -ha, but funny, interesting that I'm teaching money and financial independence. And, and again, how much is enough when I started in a trailer home? I mean, this is so far from my roots of where I started and the mindset I started in and the family I started in and, and all of that, that is just so radically different. That again, it's not, it doesn't, it's not lost on me of what a journey it's been and, and what a juxtaposition that is to kind of where I started to, to where I am. So I started there, but ultimately after, you know, being very entrepreneurial at a young age is learning like, oh, if I want to change my conditions and get out of this very impoverished situation I'm in, there's this thing called money and I want to have money. So from a young age, I was very enterprising to learn how to make money because I wanted the Jordache jeans and I wanted the Izod shirt and I wanted the all the things that allowed me to fit in with the people at school that otherwise I couldn't fit into. So that's that's kind of where my entrepreneurial journey started, which completely for no other reason than to make money. And I wanted to make a lot of it because from the purview from a kid, it's like, oh, the more money I have, the more I can fit in, the better I can feel about about myself oh, so yeah. that story started then right and then it continued long into adulthood until i changed that story but that's kind of where the story began just a love of money and a love of success and a love of achievement because the more that i could be and the more that i have i was able to prove to the world that i was somebody and mm -hmm. that worked until it didn't work anymore where uh where my kind of money where i really started to learn money where it changed for me is after college, I studied accounting and finance in college because I was, again, very motivated, like money and business, like business and accounting and finance. It must be where the money is. So even then, like that, that stayed consistent. Not that I learned anything that was applicable in college, but that's what I did. But after college, I got into real estate sales. Just I, I was going to go back to grad school, got into real estate sales. So the point of telling that story is that I was really good at making money. I was a hustler. I was motivated by money. I was motivated by the trophies. Like if I could be number one at everything, like again, that kind of mm -hmm. fit into that whole narrative that I was in. And so just very motivated. And I mean, I made more money in a year than my parents would make in a lifetime. And it just, I mean, I just, it was just so much money. And I was in the mindset like, oh, this can last forever. And, you know, all just the normal things and just focused on making more, making more. 
but that part of the journey, what was kind of this first change and under and kind of understanding or wanting to understand money differently is I'd made all that money for a handful of years. And I found myself a single mom, completely broke. We've heard these stories before, totally in debt, tax liens. And I could not afford like a roof over her head. Like I had to get very creative. And, and the only thing that kept us even going with me being a single mom with two babies was that, that peers at work pitched in and gave us some furniture and towels and blankets and prepaid <laughs> utilities. And I mean, it was horrific and it was so shameful because here I was like number one, everything. And I found myself in a situation where I had to take charity to even get the lights turned on in a crappy apartment. So mm -hmm. after I got over kind of the, some of the shame and the pity party I was in, I finally like thought to myself, how the hell did I make all that money? And I'm in this financial situation. I mean, it just, I didn't, it didn't make sense. Like I couldn't reconcile that. So that sent me on this journey that there's gotta be more to this money thing that meets the eye. And that, that was the, I think, you know, I think you read this book. Many of the listeners read the book that, that got me to the place of reading this first book, Rich Dad, Poor, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. And that book was so illuminating and mindset shifting and so like unbelievable at the time that that was like, holy shit. Like the way we think about this money thing is so off. It's so wrong. And it's, it sets us up for failure, financial failure one way or another. So that was that part of the journey. And so that got me into looking at money less as making it and more as like, how much can I kind of build my net worth and my balance sheet? And I became a pretty savvy investor, even while I was building businesses and, and doing all the things. But then, I would, but so I kind of fixed my money problem in the sense that I learned money and learned like, hey, spend less than you make and invest the difference and become a good investor and build a great business. But you know, at the same time, make sure you're not overliving the lifestyle and not building a portfolio. So I learned that lesson and that was, that worked, you know, I was doing well at that, but I was still chasing the success. I was still chasing the dollar. I was still chasing the accolades. Like enough was never enough. And, and so that's part of me I hadn't figured out yet. And it was that part of that, like second part of my money journey, if you will, that I did very well set financially, but it came at a great cost because enough was never enough. And that was all motivated from this internal belief that I wasn't enough, that, that there, you know, that I, who I was and my importance to the world was so connected to my accolades and how many zeros I had, or, you know, where I was on any chart, if you will. And yeah. since enough was never enough. I think many of us can relate to that. It, it came at a, a great cost of my health. And I had a really serious health breakdown that took me to my knees and nearly took my life. And it wasn't then till I realized going through that healing journey and, and really realizing like, oh my God, this is the second piece of the money equation that I think we have wrong is that we're always chasing that more. We're always chasing that ego. We're always chasing something. And we're, enough is never enough. We're never, we're never satisfied. We're never worthy like where we are and you know we're doing it for money's sake or to have more cloud or have more success or have more zeros or be able to have more expensive things that we can show off to the rest of the world mm -hmm. and it's not about wellness it's not about oh i need a healthy body mind spirit and family and those are the things that are important and how much money then is required in my life to, to really support to underwrite the cost of living a life that's well w-e-l-l -L. And yeah. and that brought us where we are today. That I exited my old life, sold everything that I could sell, put a torch to everything else that I couldn't sell, and really made it my life's mission to to teach money, but through the lens of it's not about how many zeros, it's about quality of life and how much money do we need to to earn and save and invest so that we have a quality of life for today and a good quality of life, you know, when we choose not to work anymore, which is what we call financial independence. Yeah. And, it, and it's cool to see your structure in that because um, what you got, you know, and Christina, there's, there's so many details in the story too, that are just powerful. Like, you know, when you showed up uh, with your two kids at the duplex that was for sale and you're like, I don't have any money I can put into this now, but can you help me? And just the way that you, I mean, you have so much grit 
Um, I mean, and, and Christina was like number one, Keller Williams, real estate mogul um, for a lot of years. And then her health took a downturn and marriage and everything. But um, so if you're looking for someone who's who's credible, someone who's been there, if you're struggling right now, um, like Christina, uh, you know, you, you've been impressive in the way that you've always come back on top. And, and so I love the structure in your model because uh, essentially, um, you know, yeah, financial independence is there, but, um, but you do it in a way where people's health is preserved in the process of accumulating wealth. And I think in America and our, our society is, um, always more is better. And whether that's more zeros, more money in the bank, um, and then we get pretty stingy when it comes to our body's own health. We think, well, um, we kind of treat ourselves like a slave. I don't know if you if you've seen that in entrepreneurs, but um, a lot of them push them themselves to just until they literally collapse, and then they finally do something about their health. But but um, what are some of the stories that you've seen, or maybe some of the people that you've helped, you know, turn their their thinking around when it comes to to money? Yeah, well. Just to add on to a few things you've said there, and and one is yeah, I mean I lost everything. So like in the in the burnout, like I just call it full burnout, but my body burned out. It's like running an F one car and just pushing it to the limits, driving it you know as fast as it can go, constantly without reinvesting in it, without caring for it, without stopping to rotate the tires and change the oil, and you know just and I think as entrepreneurs we're really geared that way. We treat our bodies as 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 a thing and if we don't really think about if our bodies give out there's nothing left to do and that's what happened is my body gave out and and when that happened so many things happened along with it it's like my body gave out but what i didn't realize is when my body can't work i can't make money you know? yeah. and, so, and everything started to collapse around me and and oh and with my body sick in bed and i can't get out of bed i can't enjoy my family I, I literally can't go out and smell the roses that we walk by and take for granted every single day mm. and these things that are so easy to take for granted become very you know you become very um remorseful that you didn't take the time to do some of these things but yeah that's a and, you know, and so this thing is like made millions, lost millions, made millions, lost millions. So that's a part of the story. So the way to, it's really easy to lose our money. Clearly, I think many of us, and in fact, I can't tell you how many kind of really multimillionaires I interview, even on my past, that type of thing. And one of my questions is, is how close to bankruptcy have you been or have you filed bankruptcy? And these are rich people. And it's, it's very few and far between that haven't had at least one bankruptcy or one close to bankruptcy. So the point is losing the money is really easy when you do all this stuff to make it. Um, but rebuilding it then to your point is structure and principles. So it's really understanding these financial principles and structure, like you said, that, you know, each time it's, you kind of learn from the mistakes like, Oh, don't do that to lose out everything. But to build it, it becomes easier over to rebuild or build becomes easier once we understand these, these principles. And one of those is, is really for entrepreneurs and business owners, what I see, what I call the biggest mistake is that we're taught as entrepreneurs to really chase and to grow. And mm -hmm. so we're constantly chasing the growth. We're constantly trying to push. And, and all the kind of the marketing out there, you know, if you're, a five-figure business is how to get to six figures. If you're a six-figure business, how to get to seven figures. If it's a seven-figure business, how to get to eight figures and so on. As though if we just build a bigger business, all of our financial problems will be solved and we'll live happily ever after. Right. It's kind of the, the way it is. And, and, and one, that leads to burnout in many cases. Two, we're burning our bodies out. We're not reinvesting in our bodies. And so many of us, I know you see this all the time, these very successful, busy entrepreneurs are coming to you and their, their bodies are a wreck. Yeah. And I know that that's what you're trying to fix all the time. Like what if you didn't have to fix so many broken people, you know, <laughs> broken entrepreneurs. Uh, but three, it's, it's not the, it's not the formula for happiness. It's not the formula for wealth. And it's just not, and it just keeps us so focused on the business and what there is, is there's a difference between income and wealth. 
Mm. And it's so fundamental and categorical difference. But until we're like really taught to think through these two different distinctions, it's all about chasing the income, building a bigger business. And every time we decide to grow the business, it comes at a greater cost, usually greater time cost, a greater capital cost, a greater stress cost. So, you know, we're back, we're just saying, hey, let's grow without factoring in the cost. Mm. And it's just, and again, it's just focused on the business and growing the business and kind of the byproduct of that is we'll make a, we'll make a lot of money and we'll, the byproduct of that is we'll have a lot of wealth and understanding the difference between income and wealth is to understand like, no income is like what the first part of income is working income. You're working right now. I'm working right now, whether we have to work or not at this point, it's irrelevant. We're both working. And yep. assuming by virtue of the work that we're doing, we're paying ourselves or so our business that's called working income. So again, the bigger our business in many cases, we can pay ourselves more if the business allows that if, through something called profitability. And we need to know the difference between revenue and profit. She's profit, not revenue of the business, which is a different conversation. But it's understanding that the income is created in the business as entrepreneurs. Wealth is created at home. Yeah. And, and tell me about that because one of your concepts was, you know, how many entrepreneurs are, you know, they're just living paycheck to paycheck, even though they're owning a business because they haven't reinvested into their own, their own wealth. And so I think that's huge. Yeah. That's the second fundamental mistake. So the first mistake of entrepreneurs is just, we focus all in the business and money just in the business and, you know, we're paying ourselves. And yep. thinking, um, bigger business is better, like more is better type of thing. The second fundamental mistake that's that's really um, a subset of that is we reinvest any extra dollars, so to speak, that we're not spending, <laughs> that we don't pay ourselves. We invest all this back into the business. Yep. So ultimately, we have one asset. And all of our investment dollars go into the business. And so the business has all of the money and businesses can, I don't know about you, but can your money just eat like the cookie monster can just gobble the money and spit? Yeah. Like, can, money, can your business just eat the money like nobody's business, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I had one of my friends, he called it like the, uh, like a money eating machine. He's just like, the bigger that my practice has grown, the more money it just eats. <laughs> And, and businesses eat money, like seriously, like if you can visualize this, it's like this thing that just loves to eat the money. <laughs> like, we don't have control over that. Like it will eat it. And that means any dollar we invest into it, the business is going to eat it. Now, hopefully the more strategic we are, we're following the dollars and we're, we're very cognizant of these reinvestments would we'll be okay. But most entrepreneurs are not. They're just putting all their extra money, again, assuming there's these investment dollars. So that's the second mistake. And what that means is that Ultimately, we want to create um, we want to create wealth. Wealth exists on a balance sheet. And so if we are worth a million dollars, our net, you know, that's our million dollar net worth, and that means on our balance sheet, not including our primary residence, it's a million dollars. So we could say if we have a balance sheet, which is our assets minus our liabilities, that we say like, okay, we want to be say it's a million dollars. The Many entrepreneurs will say, oh, well, my business is worth a million dollars. And so on my balance sheet, if I was going to show that to a banker, it's going to show the asset value of my business is a million dollars. But there's nothing else on the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. And what that means is we think that on the market, we could go sell our business, let's say net net for a million dollars. That's that's what would be worth it. Like the total value of my liabilities. But if we're being honest... Very few people that think their business is worth a million dollars or five million or 10 million can actually go out and sell it for that. So it's probably not worth that. But the point is that on the balance sheet is show us one asset. Many businesses are lifestyle businesses anyway, which means they have no asset value. Once the founder owner is gone, the, the business really doesn't have a lot of value because you know the owner is most of the value. But that's so what we want to do while we grow the business, we actually want to create personal net worth, personal wealth. And what that means is that still today, 85% of entrepreneurs are paycheck to paycheck. And it doesn't matter if their business is a million dollar business or $10 million business or $30 million business. The entrepreneur, the founder, owner, primary, kind of the primary partner, they're still paycheck to paycheck. What that means is that they pay themselves and then 
they use all that money in their household and there's nothing left over. And, but the more money they make, the more expensive their lifestyle gets. And so now what happens naturally is this stress, this constant stress that we bring in the stress home to our families, to our spouses, to our children, because now there's this constant stress because there's a certain amount of stress if we need to cover a $10,000 a month lifestyle. It's a whole different level of stress when you need to cover a $50,000 a month lifestyle. Mm. So now it's like, oh my God, now I have to go back to the business and hustle and, cr and crank it out because I have to cover $50,000 a month of bills that I've yeah. created for myself. And so that's what we call the month to month. And, and so the large majority of every business owner and entrepreneur, no matter the side of their business, is still paycheck to paycheck. And that's an enormous amount of stress. And the interesting thing about that that's, that's um, kind of the irony or the counterintuitive piece is the more money we make, the more financially stressed we get, not the opposite. Mm. That's the lifestyle we're setting up for ourselves wow. because these expensive lifestyles get, look really good. And now we get sick or something happens and now there's this different layer of stress or we start to go through divorce. All these other layers that this financial element is such an important, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a piece of all of it. Because part of that is that, again, if we can understand that the income is created in the business and the wealth is created in, in our health, our personal finance, yeah. then the easy takeaway is spend less than you make, like seriously, and have something in your margin. There's a, there's a money maxim. It's called wealth is created in the margins. Mm -hmm. And so it's in that margin where wealth is. So if we spend 100% of what we make, that we, there's zero margin. But if we spend 80% of what we make, now we have a 20% margin. We're assuming after taxes. So now that 20% is like, what am I going to do with that 20% that I'm not spending? Mm. It's like, oh, well, if I invest that, and I teach invest in financial assets and invest in your health. So we have, always have money to spend with Reagan to make sure we're either you know, optimizing our health or we're anti-aging, regenerating, whatever we need to do to take care of our F1 bar bodies as entrepreneurs. But I teach how to invest in both. But now that 20% we're using to buy assets, to build that portfolio. And we want to do that from the day that we start making money. That's the key. Like if we don't, this is at least what we can tell our kids from your first paycheck, have a, you know, a minimum of a 10% margin and work up to a 20% margin and, and live off the margin. Yeah. So that's where we start building that personal net worth. And over time, you know, you're worth five, $10 million or whatever the case is. And then, you know, you become a more savvy investor over time. So we have these two engines working that we're any, like when we're working today for our paycheck, so to speak, we're working for our current self and our current family and our current month to month lifestyle. And we're working for our 10 to 20 year older self. Mm. Working dollars today works for our current self and our future self. And we Love. can understand that. And we look at like, hey, I'm going to be, especially working with Reagan, I'm going to be 10 years older. I'm going to live 20 years older. What do I want my financial situation to be? Do I still want to be on this month to month? Do I still want to be hustling this hard? Do I still want to be taking this much risk and reinvesting everything? So the point is that we can't reinvest everything back into the business. We need to be, um, you know, you can have some in your business that you keep in your business as for reinvestment. But you keep it in the business for that business piece, but out of everything you're paying yourself, you're again, you're investing that margin of the period of time. So now the final piece to this kind of step three, if you will, is something that I call how much money is enough. And so I have this quiz and I'll send it to you um, that I really encourage anybody to take. But it's just a 10 question money quiz. And it's really to question you, like, do you know how much money is enough? Mm -hmm. And the answer is probably going to be no. And the average, so thousands of people have taken this quiz and it's so illuminating to me because again, most of the people that take this quiz, they're making pretty good money. You know, they're, you have pretty good businesses. They're making some, some good money. We're way out of the, you know, the survival numbers, well yep. over six figures of household income. And yet the average score of this quiz is 33% out of hundred percent. Wow. They take it like a test that you could score 100%. So these are smart, savvy business owners making good money with an average score of 33%. And I call this is, this is, you know, I didn't like the term financial illiteracy because it makes me think of just like beginner, Dave Ramsey, kind of the basics type, types of thing. No, I'm, I'm saying that 
These are multi-million dollar business owners that are scoring 33%. And that means we're so in the dark when it comes to the most basic personal finance questions. And the number one question that I think is the most important financial question we can ask ourselves and have the answer to is this question of how much money is enough. Because if not, it's always in the chase of more. And when you know how much money is enough and when you know you're on track based on all your spending investing practices and business practices, on, according to this, this enough number, that wipes away like 80% of the financial stress when you know your number and you know you're on track to hit it. And it's just having that clarity and the knowledge of just these 10 numbers that I put in this quiz that can completely reshape our relationship with money our mood about money, our emotional, you know, response to money is that simple of finding the answers to these kind of 10 questions with, like I said, the big one is how much money is enough. But by just asking ourselves the question of how much money is enough to live a good life, you realize it's not an easy answer. You realize like when you sit down, if I just say, hey, here's your exercise, come back in 15 minutes and tell me, you'd be like, oh, I think it's pretty easy. Then you're going to sit down and try to do it be like, oh, wait a second, there's more to this question. Um, there's questions embedded in that, that question. So right. again, the quiz, it, the quiz um, allows you to score above the average of 33%. And then two, um, it helps you identify like how much is your, how much is enough number. And, and what are some of the criteria that you're using? I mean, I'd imagine it's like, you know, you got to pay your bills and you need to have, cost of living covered. I mean, what, what's, how, how do you find your number? Yeah. So, so there's a few different parts. I'm so glad you asked. Um, but there's a few parts to it. So the first thing is, is like, if we're looking at how much money is enough, the first question we're looking at is how much is enough net worth? Because the purpose of valuing ourselves at net worth is to get to roundabout number is to understand like, it just kind of, generic financial terms uh, that $1 million equals about $50,000 of passive income. So these are just kind of, these are financial rules of thumb just to get you started. So then that's like, okay, so if I want to reach this place of financial independence or retirement or wealth, whatever, whatever word we want to give it, label we want to give it, it's then it's like, okay, how many millions do I need? if we use that rule of thumb number. So if I can live off $50,000 a year, or I'm gonna retire one day or just not be dependent on big business anymore, then like, oh, I need a million dollars. Well, 50,000 is not enough. My current lifestyle is $250,000 a year. So it's like, oh, then in that case, I need a $5 million net worth. Mm. So now the intention is to, um, I need to build a $5 million net worth. And that's called a portfolio. And so now when we're intentional about this, one, we know our number. I need to build a $5 million net worth over the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, however many times, how much, how many years you give yourself, which is part of the equation. And then it's like, okay, I can look at that as a pie chart and say, well, I'm building a business that's exitable. And if I'm going to be very conservative, let's say I could sell that for $3 million, you know, net, net, because this is net, net after taxes and paying partners and paying everything. And I forget the statistic and a little sidebar, but I, um, he's still a good friend, but I haven't talked to him in a while. But I asked him, I said, Steve, they, he, he helps businesses exit. So that's what he does. He had a big exit and um, he helps other businesses exit. And he really goes through this financial part with them because when he exited his business, he, he sold it for like 30 million or something, but he only pocketed like 8 million out of 30. Wow. And then he had to pay taxes on it. So he just, he thought, oh my God, I had this $30 million exit and that's everything we're trying to do. But after paying all the people that need to be paid and taxes and all the things like he got, and so that was just, so he didn't understand how that happened. Like, how could I only keep eight when I sold 30? Yeah. But he figured out that was kind of the formula that it's usually you're keeping maybe, you know, 40, 50% if it's great um, of the business upon an exit because of what it costs to exit and all the people need to pay it and how the stock was set up and all the different things. And so he tell, he told me the statistic and I can't remember what it was, but it was like on average 33 to 40% is what the founder keeps of, of their exit. So you think, Oh, I'm going to sell for 30, but you only come up with eight is, you know, think about how, how that, 
So it's like, oh, but and say he thought his number was 30 million, he, he sold that, but he's now eight. He's still shy of the rest if that's the lifestyle he wanted to create. So my yeah. point of telling that story is that we want to give our business a valuation if we think we can sell it, but be really conservative and maybe do that. Like take half or a third of what we even think we could sell it for if we use some of these rule of, you know, these rule of thumb numbers. But that's a piece of pie chart. It's like, okay, I could sell my business for three. I'm still $2 million short of my $5 million net worth. So what am I going to invest in outside of the business to accumulate the rest of that net worth? But, you know, but the thing mm-hmm. is, is I teach like your business needs to be a small piece of the pie chart. It shouldn't be the entire pie chart. But we're not thinking about that way because we're putting all our investment dollars back in the business mostly not even thinking it might be exit with no exit strategy, but mostly just thinking, I just need to make more money. As long as I make a lot of money, all my financial problems will be solved. So that's piece one is figuring out how much net worth do you need? And piece two of that, like I said, is you need to know how much money it costs to live your current life. Yeah. How much does it cost to live? Because you need to earn from your business enough money to cover your current lifestyle costs. And so, so saying, okay, let's see my current lifestyle. We'll keep the math easy. Let's see my current lifestyle cost, assuming, you know, no debt and different things is a hundred thousand dollars. And so I can do this math. Most of us are making more than that. So that means I need $2 million net worth. If I'm going to have a hundred thousand dollars of passive income. Yeah. um, Right. So every million is 50,000. So I need $2 million for a hundred thousand dollar lifestyle. So we need, so then it's like, okay, I need $2 million net worth that's going to cover my $100,000 lifestyle, right? So that's, those are the first two pieces. Now, what it is to that though, it takes the, it takes time and effort. It's not as obvious, like how much does it really cost to live my life? And is $100,000 enough? Maybe I'm making that now, but would I want some upgrades? Like how much does it really cost? Then how many people have actually sat down with their spouse and said, Let's talk about our life, the quality of life, what's a good life to us, meaning if it never got better than this, it would be good enough and quantify it. And it's pretty easy to quantify and get within some reasonable number. And, but that's part of the work that we never do. We do all this business strategy and all the stuff in the business, but we don't do a life strategy, mm. where, which is where life shows up. Business is business. We enjoy life through our personal vacations yeah. There are personal expenditures. There are personal investment, you know, investments in ourselves and different things. We spend money on life personally, not in our business. I mean, business mm-hmm. is a whole different thing, but we get lost in this. So it's like, no, how much, what is our life? If we want to take a marriage retreat once a year, if we want to take a family vacation once a year, this is the kind of house we want that's, you know, plenty house, but maybe not too much house. And and, you know, all the things that, that's really meaningful and quantify that. And once we know that number, now you can multiply it by 20 and know how much net worth that you need and take out the amount that you think your business might be worth. So now let's look at, okay, we've determined that we need $2 million net worth. And let's just say that um, it's $50,000 a year we need to invest outside of our business to hit this $2 million net worth in, let's say, 10, 15 years of making up numbers. So saying, okay, now my cost of my lifestyle is $100,000, but I need to invest $50,000 to hit my future self. So now my business needs to earn $150,000. And I need to have taxes on top of that. So let's say taxes are another $50,000. So where we thought that even our cost of our lifestyle is $100,000, what we have to now do is now we have to inform the business to say, hey, business, you need to profit $200,000 so that we have enough money to live our current lifestyle at $100,000. So we have our $50,000 we can invest and we can pay $50,000 of taxes. But now, you know, I'm just kind of making this numbers, making up these numbers to do the point. But how much easier is it then that now as business owners, it's like, ah, oh, shoot, the business, I just need a business strategy that profits, you know, $200,000 a year and in a 20% profit margin, you know, that means my revenue of my business needs to be X, whatever that math is. And um, let's just say in that case, it's half a million dollars. So it's like, 
for me to hit all of my numbers, I need a $500,000 business. Many coaches yeah. or different people, it's not too hard to create a $500,000 business that nets $200,000 and would allow you to live all those things. But the point is just by asking all these questions and filling in the blanks of these numbers, now we have a business financial target strategy versus like, oh my God, I need to follow what everybody's saying. I need to grow, 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 grow my business. It's like, no, as long as I can sustain this, I'm going to hit all my numbers and we're just fine. And now I don't have to be, um, you know, stressed out in my business all the time. I can, you know, have in a lot more space and different things. But again, it's, it's creating a business strategy based off our personal goals and targets as opposed to letting our business dictate what our personal goals and targets are going to be. It's complete reverse engineer. Well, it makes a lot of sense. And then um, when you can put that intentionality behind your, your business, then you can prevent the burnout because you're like, you know, you're, you're putting some money back into the tank for you. And, and money is just, it's energy, right? It's a currency, you know, we call it current uh, currency. And so it's a currency. And so if, if you can add that uh, currency in the bank, um, it's very easy to make better decisions instead of, you know, feeling like you've just got to work nonstop. And, um, and, and I like that. So, uh, so a lot of times, I mean, um, it's a process then it's not like the, the get rich quick scheme. There's no, uh, secret to success. There's just no, like, I mean, it's from your, and, and in listening to you speak and knowing your work, it's, and, and knowing all your clients, by the way, Christina has some of the most amazing people that work with her very successful people get advice from Christina. So uh, for those of you who, um, are, are listening to what she's saying. And you're like, I need to do this right now, especially if you're in like your thirties, forties, fifties, like don't wait, um, do the work because it's very practical by nature. And it's not super sexy to just like figure out your number. It's just. <laughs> well, it's not, I, I laugh because, you know, now I've been talking about kind of the personal finance side. Now let's just jump into business. I'm a business owner, you know, I, mm -hmm. I have a, I have a good business and, I'm in all the business and entrepreneurial things like the rest of us. So, you know, when I go back to the business side, a business problem that I have just, you know, funny enough is that what I teach isn't the sexy piece. It's the most, it's, I think it's more important than any other money stuff, business stuff out there is this very practical, non-sexy, non-sizzly thing. Like it really is the steak, not the sizzle, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, since it's not sexy, it doesn't sound sexy. Like my offer is more difficult to market and sell because I'm not selling like, oh, how to go from seven to eight figures and I've got the thing. But you know, my thing is, you know, I want my clients and students and those that you know work with me and go through my programs, I want them to have a seven and eight figure net worth. I could care less about the seven or eight figure business. A lot of my students have, you know, a six and seven figure business, but they're working on their seven and eight figure net worth and very mm -hmm. intentional. Freedom lives in the net worth side. It doesn't end in the business side. We can work till we're dead. We can work and be in the hustle and the grind and the burnout. You're still making a lot of money, but be no closer to any type of, you know, not financial freedom, but space freedom, time freedom where it's just like, ah, I just, I don't have to hustle today. Like I've got plenty of money that's coming to me. They're my assets. And that's, that's the feeling we want. It's, you know, people say the word financial freedom all the time. Like, again, it's about the money. It's like, no, it's not about the money. The money is just kind of this placeholder, but it's what the money creates. And it's the feeling of freedom. Yeah. It's the feeling of space. It's the yeah. feeling of like, ah, ah, man, I don't have to hustle today if I don't want to. It's that feeling we're after, but it gets even, it gets mismarketed, like, oh, create financial independence. And that's where we're going. It's like, no, you're missing the point. The hustle, the burnout comes from like every single month, we have to go back to the business and do it again. When I was in sales, you know, it was kind of my big kind of aha, kind of the earlier part of my journey too, is that, oh, when I was sales, when all I did was sales, real estate sales, it was interesting to me, like the carrot was 
all the awards, you know, back then it's like, oh, be number one producer. And I got to be on stage and I got all the medals and all the accolades that fed my ego and I'm worthy, I'm worthy because I've got all these medals, you know, and I get to put on my my website that I'm number one in all these things type of thing. And that worked for a few years where I was very motivated by that carrot. But then kind of like the fourth or fifth year of that on January one, I was like, ah, oh, shit, I have to, I'm starting at zero and I have to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's kind of that same uh, now at the end of December 31st, I can, if I did it again, I can have all those medals around my deck. But every January one, it was starting over. I'm like, this sucks. Like, I don't want to start over from ground zero on every one January one. And that same thing is what we're doing month to month. Like on, on January one, we're starting the hustle to pay December's bills and we pay December's bills. And then on February one, we're ground zero. I have to go back to the hustle so opposed to doing it on an annual basis, we're doing that month to month. And that's where the burnout happens mm. when there's no room. We have no financial room. We have no savings. We have no investments. We have no passive income. We have to go back to hustle and grind and push and stress and handle all the colossal challenges. And I don't know about you, but the bigger my business gets, the bigger the challenges, the, the more expensive the problems, the more complaining and the more HR. And, you know, it doesn't get easier with bigger. So we want to find that number that's our number that's that's about our meaningful life and our meaningful business is connected to our meaningful life and integrate these together. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. And and uh, and that's where uh, sometimes the the non-sexy, the boring is actually what gets the results. And at the end of the day, that's what it is. All the all the sizzle out there, most of the time when you meet those people, you're like, well, you're not actually not doing it. You're not, you're, you're not even where you want, you're, you're promising you can take other people to be. And, uh, but you're someone who's done it. You know, you, I, I love the way you spelled out all your assets and you showed us exactly, you opened up your own books personally. I was like, oh yeah, here's someone who's walking the talk literally. And so I, I do respect that about you and appreciate that. And, and so um, as far as someone who's engaging with you, like what's the first step? How can people, you know, that you want them to take the quiz, but um, you know, what do you have events coming up or is it your online? I know your online course is just phenomenal, but what's it like working with you? Um, I do, I do two classes per year. So I take people through, I take entrepreneurs through 12 weeks where we, as a group, we go through and we break down our business and our personal money into these different categories and i teach the my principles of money and how much to pay ourselves and you said something earlier which is so true and just to to underscore that but you said money's energy and money's currency so that's partially true water has no energy if it's sitting in a pond and you ain't doing nothing mm, yeah. water is energy when it's moving yeah. And the faster it moves, the more directions it moves, the more current it gets, right? So and electricity. So electricity is the current, currency, current. So most of us, the only currency, we're kind of the only energy of our money is what I call money in, money out. We're paying ourselves and we spend all of our money. We're not paying attention to how it's spent. And money's take money is doing all the work. I mean, it's taking a life of its own. We put it in and somehow our household can eat up all the money, just like our business can eat up all the money. Yep. So we're not we're not owners of our money. We're not we're not um, uh, movers of our money. We're not actors with our money. We're just letting we're just working hard for it and paying our bills. So one of the money principles of wealth, as opposed to income, it's that we need to give our money jobs. We need to be the CEO of our money, and we need to move it. So the way money starts growing and growing fast and when we give it current. So we create currency out of how we move it. Mm. And that's one of the principles that I teach is how to move your money and how to move it powerfully that we call it cash flowing. To get that cash flowing and flowing intentionally, moving it here and moving it there and growing it here and growing it there with complete purpose around knowing our numbers in each one of the buckets in these categories where we're the CEO of our our life. I, I teach that the you know wealth is created in the household. So I teach how to use business finance in your household and treat your household like your wealth creating business. Mm. And your business isn't a business of creating profit, which ultimately becomes your income. 
So we want to create that currency. So to answer your question, in the 12 weeks is we learn every aspect of money and how to move an account for every dollar in a powerful way so every dollar starts growing. Every dollar gets energy. Every dollar is doing something that we give it a role to do. It is just like in our business, you know, we wouldn't hire five people and have them all do the same thing. But, you know, when we hire five roles in our business and we hold those roles accountable and those each, we, you know, five talents, that's when we know we, we like, <laughs> that's great business. It's like, wow, I'm a leader. And um, as the CEO and leader of my business, and assuming I can hire five people that are the five fundamental roles of my small business, they're great talent. I manage them. I grow them. I hold them accountable. I invest in them. I have a relationship with them. I care for them. We're tracking the results. You know, they're getting rewarded on the results that they create. That we can do amazing things with five great people. But if they all did the same things or weren't managed, we treated them badly or we had no relationship or we didn't pay attention to them, those great five people are probably going to do well in our business and they probably just even disappear. Right. So, but that's, we get that in business. So now in our household, we want to, even in business too, but we want to do the same thing with our money. We want to have this relationship with our money and give it roles, give it jobs, and hold our money accountable, and track the results, and track the KPIs, mm -hmm. and know what we're after, and measure the results of our money relative to the goals that we set with our money. So when we when we um, employ the same kind of business practices in our money as we do with our business, assuming we've kind of nailed it in our business, money outperforms any person will ever perform. And it takes direction so well. And it, does, it works 365, you know, 24-7 a day. It never takes a break. It doesn't argue back. It doesn't have moods. It doesn't take vacations. And that's what we're missing again, because we just think, oh, if we work really hard and create a big business, we're going to have plenty of money. And that's why 85% of entrepreneurs are still month to month. Mm -hmm. Because we're living in this total mythical nature and belief system of, you know, how money works and, and again, just over-focused in our business. And kind of the final piece to that, like um, what, we, what we do in the 12 weeks is we call it meaning and money. And it's really the whole program is organized around, like I said, answering this philosophical question of what is a good life? Mm. What is meaningful? What is, what is a good life today? And what is a good life for my, you know, 10 or 20 year older future self is going to be here before I know it. And how do I take care of the concerns of myself today, myself tomorrow, our family, and maybe any legacy? So we start there and then we start quantifying everything and then start breaking it down to these pieces. But it's a life force more than it is like a money force, even though we're using money as kind of the, the, the tool and the money as the, the microscope in a way that helps us develop a whole different one relationship with our money, practice with our money, but again, it's organized around quality of life and meaning of life. And like I said, in one of those is how much do I invest back in my own body and my own self to make sure that my body is always able to perform? Yeah, well, I love that. And I think that's where, um, you know, just to round off what you started with is, you know, there's wealth and there's the derivative of what the word wealth means. And you're teaching true wealth principles, which is priceless. And but you're doing it in a way that's practical because those are the things that actually work. They, you know, these principles, you know, it's not some fly by night uh, principles, but you're actually helping people get grounded in the fact that, hey, you you can actually choose the lifestyle that you want if you just make these 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 little simple decisions to I, I love what you said, like think of your money as like five employees in your your household and and then have some accountability and checklists. Is is it working the way that you want it to? So, man, this has been phenomenal, Christina. I am, um, man, I I love this, and we got to have you back on for sure. But the best thing that people can do right now is, uh, from what I can tell, is take the quiz. Like, see where you're at. If you, you know, because I know a lot of you are doing great financially, but um, maybe there's some room for improvement. And so. Uh, they, they take the quiz, they go to wisemoneymethod.com slash quiz. Is that correct? Yeah, wisemoneymethod.com forward slash quiz. Yeah, take the quiz again. It's just, it's very eye-opening. 
And even if you got 100%, then you don't need me or anybody like me. But if you're scoring under 50, there's, like you said, probably room to improvement. And it's probably going to surprise you. Like, it's just a surprising thing. Um, so I encourage everybody to take the test, but the quiz. But what it is, is that even before, take the quiz, but what's also attached to the quiz once you take it is you get a little workbook. And it's going to guide you through really what I teach in the program over 12 weeks, kind of the overview guide. But will help you answer all those 12 questions on your, on your own. But I encourage everybody to try to come up with their good enough number before they before they do the workbook. But the workbook is is really valuable and helpful. And then you know in that there's a way to like after you take that if you want to set up a like a 45 minute just money consult with me, ask me any money question or investing question. I you know I offer that for anybody that's you know taken a quiz and done the workbook. So I'm happy to go through that. That's a way to get on my calendar if anybody's listening and just wants to have a money talk and and chat about money business or anything that has to do with money in business. Well, love it. Well, well, for those of you who um, love the show, make sure you share it with uh, your friends, your family, especially your kids, anybody who you think could use some uh, support when it comes to money talk. And there's no one better than Christina Wise. So, uh, Christina, thanks so much for for being on the show and for being a great friend and collaborative partner. Really appreciate you. My pleasure. Thank you so much.